Now we've talked about the Peter Sutcliffe Yorkshire River by Tony Gibb. Hi, I'm I've got to say before I start that um, because this is a public gathering and I don't know why people are, of, uh, you know, if they're coming here, think knowing this is on or what they think this is going to be, I can tell you that it's about murder and it's about a lot of murders. Uh, I don't show any gruesome or grisly horrible pictures because that's disrespectful to the people who have died and it's disrespectful to you. But I can't talk about uh, hunting a murderer without talking about the murders. So I will show pictures of the victims, but only in, uh, in the times when, in the case of most of these, when they were in police custody for something or other. So there's no horrible pictures, but it is about murder. So if you're concerned about murder uh, and you don't want to hear any more, precise. <laughs> Uh, there, maybe up the back if you prefer. Okay, <coughs> right, I'll get, I'll get cracking then. My name's Tony Davey, and I'm a retired police inspector from West Yorkshire Police. I joined the police in uh, Cleveland in 1970. You know what a mess Cleveland in, is in. So I left Cleveland and I uh, transferred to West Yorkshire where I thought big is probably better. But it turned out to be better because I was promoted to sergeant within two years of getting there. Transferred there in 1978 and was promoted to Sergeant 1980. So that meant during the course of all these rippers, I was a constable in, um, in West Yorkshire. And uh, on my. Sorry about this, we had trouble with this. I'm on somebody else's computer and I'm not quite sure how this is going to go. Right. Uh, on my transfer to uh, West Yorkshire, that's where I was posted to, Queen's Road Police Station, on, uh, just on, in Manningham Division. Does anybody know Bradford? At all, you're it's probably you're probably wisest if you. Oh dear. Yeah. Where from? Where about? Um, I'm from West Yorkshire, Halifax. Halifax. Oh, Halifax will feature in this then, won't it? Later on, yeah. Um, my wife's from there. No, oh, there is. It's a bonded yeah, body. Right. Now, before yeah. I start, did you all see that program? Those three programs that were on not long ago. Uh, just in the last few months, uh, that uh, news team were going all over the ripper things again and, and trying to sort of tell people to to, to um, explain their role in it. And it was a, a team of young uh, journalists. I'll, I'll say no more about that, because if you didn't see it, I, I wouldn't be able to ask you if you believed it or not. Anyway, Queen's Road Police Station, that's it. That's the, that's the division. And if you come out of that police station, that's a steep hill as you can see. You walk to the top of the hill and you turn left. That will take you to the red light area, and then it will take you into the city centre. About a 15 minute walk. You go up the top of the street and turn right, it will take you to the posh end of uh, Manningham Division. A place called Heaton, where it's entirely different parks and that sort of thing. So, that's in the middle. And I could walk from there and walk around the entire division uh, in about half an hour. Yet there were thousands of people who lived there. So I'll explain a little bit later on about, uh, about the situation that there is in that division. Um, the Ripper killings, as I've said, were on when I transferred. So, before we go any further, does everybody know, or does anybody know, the name of the Ripper? Peter Sutcliffe. Peter Sutcliffe. Okay, yep. I think it's that one that goes That's the guy, Peter William Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper. Handsome fella, isn't he? He was, was in those days. Now, can anybody tell me who he looks like? Remember, this is 1970s. Who does that guy look like from the 1970s? I know nobody here is old enough. So, so I'll remind you that it's this fella, Jason King, Peter Wingard. And, you know, we have trends, don't we, of what, what hairstyle we have. I mean, if you describe somebody now, uh, in the future, it would be very short hair, tattoos, wouldn't it? You know, so they are rather stout. So everybody looked like Jason King. It, but what I want to tell you right now is remember everything I'm telling you because later on you're going to make some decisions based upon what you know. Because I'm going to appoint all of you now as a senior investigating officer. And your job, the chief constable's told you, get in here and go and solve these ripper killings because nobody else has done it. And I want you to do it. Go and catch it. So you're now going to make all the decisions and you've got 500 officers under your command and you've got to decide what you're going to do when each club comes in. And if you get it wrong, somebody dies. Because you didn't catch the ripper because you went off chasing, you know, blind alleys. And if you get it right, you catch him quick. He wasn't caught quick. So don't be ashamed to make mistakes. Um, okay. Right. Let's see where, where I got to. The hunt for the Ripper didn't go smoothly, I'm sure you know that. It didn't go according to the, the, plan, the normal plan of murders. 
Um, I'll go back one because I didn't have the right guy. This guy, born 1946 to a Catholic family and he lived in Bingley. And uh, if you know where Bingley is, it's just outside Bradford, it's a small town up the Air Valley from Bradford. And uh, he, was, he was a loner at school, nobody liked him. He's already showing signs of being a little bit on the outside. And he left school at 15. When he got some menial jobs, uh, building work, um, things like that. But one of his jobs was as a grave digger uh, in, in Bingley Cemetery. And that's very important. Keep that in your mind. Because you're going to have to, you've got, that's going to come back to haunt you later on. He was a grave digger. At age 19, he got a heavy goods vehicle license. And he worked for a Bradford haulage company. That meant extensive travel through the night, all over the place, to you know, different force areas, different parts of the country. To look at, and not only that, he lived in Manningham Division. So the scene was probably set. He married Sonia, his wife, in 1967. They had no children and she was very, very dominant. She said, Peter, jump, Peter, jump. She was also schizophrenic. Uh, and uh, she posed a number of problems. They lived in a nice house. at Garden Lane in Heaton. Now, to describe the division, it's split into two. At that end, there's all parks and uh, gardens and wide thoroughfares, tree-lined, all the street lights worked, and it was considered to be very select. There was doctors, lawyers, um, school teachers, long-distance lorry drivers, and the like, all lived there. Shady, leafy, proper suburban place. The other end of the division, Manningham Division, was a hellhole. It was the worst division in West Yorkshire Police area. It, 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 it was a red light area. It had drugs, it had crime, it had racial tension, it had old factories that were falling down. Remember the dark satanic mills? It was just an awful place. It was unsafe, but main a main road ran right through it, and there was uh, an awful lot of trouble there. And I spent 20 years of well, about a good 15 years say, of my life, walking the streets of the red light area, the only person that never got tapped up. Um, right, very early on, um, he, the Ripper developed a macabre sense of humour. He told the most disgustingly awful jokes, apparently, that nobody ever laughed at. They just thought it was odd. Um, and he had a growing obsession with voyeurism. Voyeurism is um, watching people have sex. And in the case of Banningham, well, he didn't have to go far, they were everywhere. So he'd just go look in car windows. And he wasn't alone, there was lots of them. Part of the job of being there was to stop these people from being a nuisance because they got attacked by the pimps and the... There was all sorts of trouble they caused. So he was one of those, sneaking around there with a long mac, spying on people. Um, I didn't do it. There's no reason why I should have that time do it. He's a regular nighttime <laughs> traveller through the division. And uh, he's the type of guy who you would like, like the milkman would wave at him because it's lonely out there on nights. You know, and if you see another human being who looks a bit friendly, not the ones that are human beings are used to, then you would, uh, would be rather happy to just wave and say hello. Particularly if you saw the regular. There was lots of other people taxi drivers. It would be helpful, wouldn't it? <laughs> Um, so, this isn't about um, so much his victims or his crimes. I want, to take, I want to take you on the trail now and the hunt for him and how it all went wrong and where it went wrong. See if you could have done better because you're going to make the decisions very shortly. Um, he started in September 1969. And finished in November 1980. And in, those in that time he committed 23 serious crimes. Um, 13 murders and 10 attempted murders. Now that's an awful lot in 11 years. 23 serious crimes. Considering that arrest rates were pretty much on 100% until then. Then it became zero. Um, they always use the same modus operandi, and if you don't know what a modus operandi is, it's a way of operating. And criminals do that because they have this comfort blanket, how they want to, uh, how they want to commit the crimes. So, if a, if a burglar, for instance, urinates on your settee, because that's what he does, and they call the police, you go, I know who's done that, and they think, why, oh, he's good. You know, 
So off he goes out to his house and arrest him. They've got the faintest idea while he's arrested. So next time he comes oh, out, he arrests on the settee. Oh, yeah. And that's so you can from an MO. They can't change their MO because they're not very successful with a different one. So they tend to use the same one. Now the Ripper, there's no different from anybody else. They had an MO, he always did the same thing. But not always. He occasionally changed his MO for a variety of reasons. Sometimes to throw us off the scent, and sometimes to uh, just because the circumstances were different and he hadn't got his hammer, his trusty hammer with him, he only had a piece of rope or something like that. So that, that tended to throw things a little bit. He also had a hatred of prostitutes. He wanted to eradicate the world with them. That's what he tells us. Um, so he two of the red light there, he'd pick prostitutes up. He would uh, then take them to the standard area where they normally would go to, back of a factory, where out it would come the ball pine hammer and he'd hit them over the head. He didn't do it once, he did it quite a lot of times, you know. You were going to be sure, haven't you? But they might just have survived the first 20 years. Um, then in a rage he'd cut them, cut them with knives or anything else he had available. That's as much as a gore as I'm going to tell you about. Then he'd, then he'd dump them in leisure. Um, there were some variations which confused the investigation quite quite a lot, and that was through not through him changing for logical reasons, just because he didn't have a choice when he was there at the time. He said, "Oh, that's a decent one. Oh, let me hammer it. Oh, oh somebody must be washing it. Oh, I knew that." So he did change his MO sometimes. Sometimes he got disturbed that he couldn't do what he wanted to do, and he left it a bit untouched. Anyway. Also, the magnitude of his crimes were. Geographically, very, very widespread. Right. This, this shows that where his crimes were committed. Um, twelve police divisions. Twelve. Well, nobody goes around murdering in twelve different police divisions. Six cities. Two, two force areas. Uh, over eleven years. I mean, you were chasing all the time, you weren't detecting, you were just going from one crime to another. Of course, it sometimes happened only days apart. I'll explain much more about that later on. Um, everything in this investigation caused a problem for the police, because every bit of it was unprecedented. It never happened before, and there's never been a man like it ever before or since um, in, in Britain, in, in the, with the magnitude of what was going on here. I also want you to bear in mind the scene, that, uh, to set the scene for you. There's no computers. We haven't even got Pac-Man. Remember then? That, that's it. We were just, they were just starting to start them, so there was no central database of vehicle numbers. There was no fingerprint uh, records. There was, um, there was no forensics, really. The best you could do is find out somebody's blood type. You couldn't match anything. There's no DNA. That hadn't been invented. Everything was a paper record. So everything was done by somebody going out, talking, writing it down, passing it on, and somebody reading it later and deciding what they were doing. So none of the aids they've got now. But then he didn't need them there. Um, and everything was paper driven. But murder rates were high because murders were very rare and they were always localised. And they were detected quite easily because. They were known to the person that they murdered. Stranger murders were very rare. Um, and serial murders were almost unheard of. And serial murders at that scale was unheard of. So murders were local. You could detect them easy enough. Often they were sloppy. They just did it at the spur of the moment and walked off leaving, you know, the dripping shoes and they go into the house and have a cup of tea and you just follow the footprints. So there was all that. Before he started killing women though, he, he started attacking them. And he attacked four women before anybody came to so put together what's something going on here. So, the first one was in September 1969 in Manningham, the Ripper attacked a woman. She survived. And she gave a good photo of it. That says after the first arrest, which is what it is. Um, that's the person she described. Now, that looks a little bit like uh, what we've already seen, doesn't it? Yeah. So he was arrested, and uh, fingerprints taken, and then she withdrew the charges. So, the law says, he's off he goes, 
There's your fingerprints, take them with you, we can't keep them, you haven't been convicted of anything. We took them to identify you, now we can go. So he goes. Why? Why would she do that? Well, she was a prostitute. I'll bet he went and gave her some money. Uh, or the pimp said, you're not going to go, no, not having you go to court, I don't have police coming round here. Just forget about it. Whatever reason it was, she withdrew the charges. And that's quite common. People do withdraw the charges. They don't want the aggro. They're told they have to go to court and give evidence. Oh, I'm not going to do that. I can understand all that. So maybe that's what happened. I don't know. It was before my time. But then there was a, almost a year, because it was July 1970. Uh, sorry, there's six years, sorry. Then there's one in 1975. So there's nothing for six years. And that's at Keithley. I'll go back again. Just to, I won't go back too often. So, number one was down there at Manningham in Bradford, number two was at Keithley, up that sort of way. Um, same again, hit somebody over the head with a hammer and off he went, and she survived. Then, one month later, number three, at uh, Halifax, your place. Halifax, number three. Uh, you see there, Halifax, you've got a number three, that's where he attacked one there, a month later. But none of these people knew about the others because they were just assaults on prostitutes. Well, it's a nightly occurrence. Not only a nightly occurrence, it's an hourly occurrence in Manningham. And not only on prostitutes, by prostitutes. That's what, let's even this up a little bit. So we've got three attacks. There's only those three police stations know about them. None of them are detected. Nobody's even looking, I don't think. It's a punter. You know, they're probably dealing with another prostitute who's beaten somebody up or, or a murder or something. Doesn't matter. There's been three, and we haven't even spotted them yet. Then we get to uh, 12 days later. 12 days, he's back in Keithley again for number four. So you think, well, they'd link that, wouldn't you? No, not, not long between them, but there's been two. Why don't they link them? Because we're totally different. Nobody died. They're assaulting on, on prostitutes. No, that's... What happens? We're not going to find him. Uh, there's too many <coughs> dissimilarities to, to link them. So, whatever the reasons, and I wasn't there then, none of those were considered. Nobody thought there was anybody on the, on the that's about to start killing people on, on a large scale. Okay. So, we've already got a muddled investigation. You can see it's going to get a little bit bigger, can't you? Yeah. But then October 1975, 1975, Wilma McCann, she was the first person to be murdered and she was a prostitute in Leeds. Um, and the murder hunt began, concentrating on the right red light area of Leeds because assaulting prostitutes is different to murdering prostitutes, you know, uh, as, it, as it was. So the, a murder squad was launched in Leeds to try and find out who did this, and they're best of luck to them, because you wouldn't have got a peep of information. But they launched uh, a murder investigation, and it was concentrated just on the red light area of Leeds, because there wasn't a great deal else, you, where else could you go? You didn't link the other four, because they were, they were somewhere else. But then 80 days later, Emily Jackson. 80 days. You've already just got your team formed and you've started looking, making your inquiries and you know, you've done a few bits and pieces. You've, you've tracked down all the people she knows and, and, and then comes along Emily Jackson. Second murder victim. Same area of Leeds. In the red light district. Should there have been patrols in the red light district? Did, who thinks yes? Would we have gone down with loads of bobbies and walked around? Nobody, nobody thinks yes. We didn't. Why wouldn't we? Because the prostitutes and the pimps complain. What are you doing? Yeah, go on, clear off. You know, we sort our own business out down here. And you got nothing but aggro from them. And you weren't going to gain anything. The guy wasn't going to come back again and do another one, surely. You're investigating what could be a one-off. You're not expecting a second murder in the same area. Suddenly there is one. So you've now got two in the same spot. You might now start to think, hang on, there's something right here. There's a serial killer on the loose. Uh, we might do something about it. So you put more officers onto the murder squad, it gets a little bit bigger now. And now you've got a lot of clues. Um, and the first clue, and this is where you as senior investigating officers have got to make a decision, um, is a Wellington boot print, size 8. 
found at the scene of Emily Jackson's murder, which is at the back of a factory, a half derelict factory, but still some units being used during the day. Now, <coughs> there's thousands and thousands of pairs of these have been sold. Who as a senior investigating officer would decide to put a team of people on to search for the owners of those wallet boots because, and I'll tell you a clue, if you're right, who was wearing them wallet and boots has killed two women. So would you ignore it or would you go and put officers on it? And what would anybody... Who sent who put people on it? Yeah. Oh, the other half, yeah. And the others, I think, would think, no, it's a waste of time, I'm not going to bother. I'm going to get nowhere with this. Thousands and thousands of pairs, how are we going to find them? You know, how long how, how is it going to take? So, that's your decision. We'll see how, it, see how it pans out later on. Three months later, I mean, the time scales here are incredible. We've got Marcella Claxton. Um, now, she was a prostitute in Leeds, and she survived. And she gave, now, you're going to like this one, the best description you'll ever see of anybody. Now, yeah, that's her description of the, of the killer. I mean, the only thing you can say about that is it looks like the guy we've already seen so many times, doesn't it? Sort of. But that's the best she could come up with. Anyway, um, but she did name a car. Well, she said it was a white car with red upholstery. Oh, that's got to be a good clue, hasn't it? But she, the car wasn't traced, nor was an attacker. No. Uh, why? Why do you suppose that, that happened? No leads were followed up. Something went wrong. The SIO said, oh, Jack, this is. I'll tell you why. Because that, that one, was a liar. She'd had so many complaints to the police about just about everybody. They had a file on, a very, a very thick file. There's no doubt she'd been assaulted. But anything she said, you could take with a pinch of salt. And were you going to commit officers to go and chase it up her leads? You no. Know. So the SIO said, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm not even going to bother with this one. And that description, well, that couldn't match anybody. So that was, nothing was followed up. She was a time waste. Nine months later, so you're still investigating what you've got so far, too. Sorry. The next one, nine months later, was this lady, Irene Richardson. Um, there was a very important clue uh, found here. A car tyre track was found at the scene. Find the car, find the killer. Find the wallet and go, find the killer. That sort of fits in, doesn't it? So, we're going to, are we going to find this car? I'll give you some idea of what we're talking about here. Dunlop came up and they looked at the tyres on the car and they said, right, those are the 26 makes of types of car that, uh, that will have these tyres on. There's your records, 100,000 of them in West Yorkshire. But, it's a clue, who was an SIO is going to assign officers to that? Nobody? No, you won. Yeah, you can you afford, can't afford to ignore it, can you? It's found at the scene of a, of a dead body. And you know what type of car it is, one of 26, one in 100,000. But the problem you've got here now is, how many do you put on? Because you've got to find these 100,000 cars before the tyres have been changed, or the cars changed hands. And where's your records? They're all in the town hall on a card system. So you want to get a huge team, 50 officers, to go and chase some 100,000 cars. To go with the 50 officers you've already sent on the boat. boats. Now, so your hunch might be right. But you're not making it too big that you lose all your officers and not too small that you can't do the job. So that's another clue that you've looked at and you've made a decision. Let's hope you're right, eh? Don't watch every decision you make. Um, by now, you're getting a bit overwhelmed by the reports coming in because I want to explain to you now the structure of a murder squad. It's, this isn't Barnaby, you know, or, or Moss or anything like that. A murder squad consists of one man at the top, the senior investigating officer, that's you right now. You're it. You make every, every major decision. Below you, you've got sergeants and inspectors who interpret their, that decision and filter and vet the work that's coming in to feed you the vital information so you've got something to make a decision on. And their job is to gather this information, sift it about. Below them are the people who are going to do the work. They're given a task to do, and they go and do that task 
without any distractions. So if I send you to go and see if somebody's got a pair of green Wellington boots, I don't want you to come back and tell me he's got a tie and pearl on his drive. Because that's only going to muddy my waters. I've got somebody doing that. I don't want you telling me that you're thinking. You know, set out to think, you set out to do. Because we can't have everybody doing all the thinking. So you go out, you do your task, you come back, you feed it into your sergeant, the sergeant passes it up to and the SIO accepts it or discards it. So the sergeants and the inspectors will put together what they think is a trend. Okay? So that's your job at the bottom, and your job at the top is to make these sort of decisions. Right, the next one. Patricia Atkinson. Uh, Patricia Atkinson's um, was 76 days later. Look at the time scales here. I mean, 76 days, that's no time at all if you're going from murder to murder. That's sort of about the average of what he did. So 76 days later, Patricia Atkinson. Now, Patricia Atkinson lived there. See those trees at the back? That's Queen's Road Police Station, for God's sake. So she lived in the house at the back. She lived in the bottom flat on the left, and a friend, the one at the end of the, you know, that one, the middle one, and a friend, another prostitute, lived opposite. Now, I knew Pat Atkinson. I thought she was, in, she was intelligent. She was, you know, she, she seemed to have her head screwed on right, but uh, she preferred to work from her own home. And I told us, we all told her so many times, that's going to be dangerous. You can't invite your unknown punters into your house to have sex. You better to expose yourself outside to them. Because they can, you know, sooner or later they'll turn up on your doorstep. You know, don't do it. But she saw it as a different way around. But she said, I've got an engagement with my friend opposite, you know, whenever I, I'm entertaining. I'm, you know, I'm entertaining in the house, you know, she'll look after me. But she goes out. She doesn't ever stay in. So she made a mistake. She invited the wrong man into her house. And um, he killed her. It was a shame. She was a, a, I quite liked her, actually. This is the first murder outside Leeds, because of course it's in Mattingham in Bradford, so what do you do? You set up a new murder room. You can't have the Leeds one covering it, because you haven't actually decided that this is all linked yet. You know, you get a feeling that there's a serial killer, but you want local bodies. I can just imagine what happened if a, if a, a Leeds uniform PC went into the red light <laughs> area in Mattingham and started asking questions, you know, what you'd find his bones later. You know, you've got, to, you've got to be known. These people only respond to people they know. So you've got to have local officers who know the area. So you start a murder room at, the, at Bradford, which is where this murder is taking place. Now you've got two locations where these things happen in. You saw the map. You can imagine how many there's going to be. Um, so that's the first murder outside Leeds. New incident room set up and a lot more detectives needed. Now pulling them in a, from everywhere now. What do we find at the scene? Now then. A Wellington boot print, the same Wellington boot print. So those who wouldn't have followed it up, hang your heads in shame. Those who would, you've moved a little step closer. You now know. Find who was wearing that Wellington boot, you found the murderer. But we've still got thousands of these things to trace. How do you trace a pair of Wellington boots? But you know, you know, it's a link, it's the only real link that you've got. Um, by now there's public unease. There's a serial killer on the loose. Four murder scenes with ongoing inquiries. Four pre-murder crimes that are now starting to get linked in here somewhere. They're looking at what other crimes have been. 100,000 vehicles being traced. Well, it in book print to follow up, thousands more of them. And now you've got photo fits to start circulating uh, to the public. You know, have you seen this man? Well, everybody's seen that man, haven't they? Anyway, so we'll get on. Public anger is starting to get in the way now. Uh, Prostitutes get pressured by groups, and if you love this one, groups of women going into the red light areas trying to lecture prostitutes about, you know, how evil it is to do what they're doing. Not only is it evil to do what you're doing, you're putting yourself at risk until the pimp comes out with a, an iron bar and so explains to them that the rules that go on in a red light area. And then they're in the police station complaining that they've been attacked by a man with an iron bar. It, you know, it didn't help anybody. Thousands of years has been prostitution. Nobody's found an answer yet. So you're going down into a red light area trying to persuade a prostitute to stop doing what the only thing that she can do to earn money, you know, she ain't going to stop. She's been brought up like that, and that's what she does. The best I could hope to do was keep them safe. You know, I couldn't interfere with their business. Uh, you know, it wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to stop it. You can't stop it. 
but you can make them follow simple rules and you can keep them safe. Uh, that's Sorry if that doesn't sound right, but that's all you could do. There was that many of them. Um, demonstrations then started happening. Sex clubs and uh, anywhere that the gathering of men that they thought was a bit seedy would be picketed. And uh, of course the men didn't like it because they were starting to take photographs of them. Uh, so we had a police presence outside all these places half the night. Extra patrols in red light areas so that people felt safe. But you yeah, were expected to have extra patrols and look away. Oh, well, she's picking one up. <laughs> and she got it all Yeah. So, all these things that you have to do, all these things. Um, um, attacks on men by groups of women. If you looked anything like poor old Jason King, you know, you were in a bit of bother. If you were seen somewhere where women thought you ought not to have been, that was on earth. Um, so, you that old dream manpower. <coughs> you know, there was no policing getting done anywhere. So, it's time to start some new initiatives that we've never done before. The river's out there every night, doing something. Murdering people mostly, but otherwise he's out there. Let's see if we can catch him. So this is what we did. Expli I'm going to explain now about the tape recordings of cars. I was in the only of those little cassettes where you push the button here, they flipped up. I got one of those and a little microphone, me and my mates, and we sat in a car on, on, on the streets of the red light area, reading, uh, speaking into this microphone, Every car number that went past for four hours, hundreds of them. You should have seen Manningham in them days. It was hundreds. So every car, blah, 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 did you get that one? Blah, blah, blah. And then you hand it in, and then you go on with four hours of policing, which usually consisted of going straight back to the red light area to walk around and to scare somebody off, somebody who you didn't know. Um, and then what happened with those tape recordings? Every morning, a group of detectives would come in, take those tape recordings, go down to the local town hall, which is where your driver's records were kept then, if you remember, and whether you remember the day, he used to apply, they're all kept under, in the crypt underneath the town hall, in, in a file index, none of this DVLA where everything was done by computer, it didn't exist, you just had a card. So they'd go down, read who was on this card for this car, and that would, that would start an inquiry. And one of the sergeants in the murder room would allocate somebody to go and check that driver out, why was he in the area at the time? Um, that actually turned out to be good later on, but for that, for then it was just hopeless. Um, so that's what that's what happened with that. And then came the clipboard checks. Now you'll look this, you'll love this one. When you're short of initiatives, think of something stupid. Um, I was given a clipboard, and there I am with my clipboard and my torch, and I have a list of prostitutes, by the way, we've spoken to them, and they agreed that they would. Um, Tell us where they take the clients on condition we didn't arrest them there. Uh, well, we didn't know where they were going in the first place, so it seemed a fair idea for us. Not a lot of point in saying where you're going to go for sex in the car tonight. I was going to go around the back of the well, come on then, well, when should you find it? Arrested? I thought we frosted you. It doesn't work. So we agreed with them that, you know, we'd keep it discreet if they'd keep it discreet, and we'd check the places where they took the prostitutes. And if, there, if you were there, and this is what we're told, if there's movement in the car, walk away. Oops, oh dear, oh. So we had to just, because they were still at it. And let them be at it, you know, they're alive. Um, but if, if, if there was no car there, we got out of torch, we had to go searching in all the corners to see if we could find a body. And you're hoping and praying you didn't. You know, because you might not find a body, you might find the ripper. You know, with his knife and his hammer and his screwdriver and all the rest. But, so you were doing that night after night for four hours. Uh, again, and you put word out you were doing this. So that hopefully the ripper wouldn't do anything. You know, it was less an exercise of uh, catching him, more an exercise of stopping him from doing any more to give a bit of breathing space. But that's what we had to do. And then the secret envelopes came. And the secret envelopes was that the inspector of every shift would get an envelope on a night and it would tell him what to do at one o'clock in the morning. He'd open the envelope and it'd say, road check, and it's such and such a road. Always a busy road. So you all went up there and stopped every car. And you were told what to look for. But you didn't know what was current with what the latest information was. So it might be looking for well and boots. So every car gets stopped. Has it got these tyres on? Is it, has it got well and boots in? You know, and record every car that you'd, you'd stopped. And traffic was queuing for miles. And there was irate drivers weren't marching up. We'll have a word for you. I've been in there two hours. So it stopped. But we carried on doing it because 
He's got to be driving around somewhere, hasn't he? He's all over the place. He's got to be out there. And if you can just get him in one of these road checks, you've got, you know, you've, if he's out there and you're stopping the cars, you've got him. So you've got a few, an, an extra few things that you can do. Um, so, there was a national, oh, sorry, after that we get that one. That's the one that caused the greatest problem of all up to that point. 63 days after Patricia Atkinson, this girl was murdered, Jane MacDonald. Now, she wasn't a prostitute, first non-prostitute. Not only that, she was 16 years old. Um, and she wasn't in a red light area. She was on the fringe of it because she had to pass through it. Like if you were walking down Manningham Lake and going to the city centre, you'd walk down the, through the fringe of the red light area. But it's a busy thoroughfare, you know, with nightclubs and bars and things like that. So you couldn't be linked to prostitution for doing that. But she walked there. Okay. This caused such a national frenzy. And this now led to packs of vigilantes organising themselves into packs and having briefings at some people's houses and sending out like, now you go and go five lads, oh, I'm going to do such and such an area, and you go there. If you, meet, if you meet any people that look a bit unsavory, give them a bit of a battery and keep them off the streets. You can imagine what chaos that caused all over the place, because it was Leeds, Brad, Bradford, and you know, they were there. Um, but then we got uh, the press involved. They started going around the streets, stopping prostitutes and asking them questions. <laughs> So you got reports of journalists found severely injured, you know, because the prints had come out. So what do you think they're doing? You know, bam, they're just, just so it meant it even more complicated. So the red light not area now was patrolled by anybody but the Ripper. If you see what I mean, that's why you think people who aren't crusty groups anymore. Okay. Yeah. Then we got further instructions about the robots. Uh, because a lot of complaints have come in from the owners of haulage companies whose um, drivers were behind time. Sometimes they were behind time for hour after hour. And they were getting stopped every night. Because, you know, they, they went all over the place. And so we had to put a compromise with them. And we said, right, if they've been checked more than once, well, if they've been checked twice, we won't ever check them again. Because we've cleared them. So we had a list of names of people and vehicle numbers and company vehicles, you know, because it's always on the companies, for people who weren't to be stopped. So top of this list was through the night heavy goods vehicle wagon drivers. Now who do we know who drives a heavy goods vehicle through the night? Peter Sutcliffe. So Peter, come on, get, 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 get. never mind, he's coming past. What's the point? It was completely waste, waste of time, wasn't it? Because we had checked him, we'd been to his house, but when we went to his house, we were looking for something entirely different. We were looking for the Wellington boots or the car, not the guy in the van. So suddenly, so the, people, the guy we were looking for was exempted from being stopped. Okay, that's a mistake, but what else could you do when these people are coming all the time and they've got, they've got heavy authorities behind them, you know, big powerful companies who are putting pressure on say, for God's sake, you know, how many more times are you going to do this? We've lost so much money and so much trade and our oh, vehicles can't move. Okay. By now, the Sutcliffe have been checked out 16 times. Not interviewed at his home, but checked out. But, and to be honest, he wasn't alone in that. Loads of people have been checked out more than 16 times. And you know, to, be, to be fair to them, including him at this point, he was checked out because he was in a bad place when we were doing a road check, or because he happened to have owned one of these types of vehicles, or he had a pair of weapons, and nothing was getting linked because it was everywhere. If it was just one man we were looking for, and, and a narrow field, it would be okay. At this point, Assistant Chief Constable George Oldfield took over. Now, he had a good track record, and we thought, this is it, this is, this is the guy who'll get our man. Um, so, he took over. He didn't have long to wait. Because, 14 days later, Maureen Long came along. Now, Maureen Long, uh, she wasn't murdered. She was, uh, she was injured. Se seriously injured. Um, she's a very... I knew her as well. She was very difficult to handle. Uh, I, mean, I don't mean handle that. I mean deal with. You know, I touch her. To the hell. Um, she, she was a liar. An inveterate liar. She just... She made stories up, she told lies, she attacked people for no reason, she got drunk, she was on drugs, you name it. So, but she got attacked, can't deny she got attacked, and she got attacked by the Ripper across the M.O. was right. But she, um, 
She gave a description of somebody which was completely wrong, um, but different from everybody else's. So offered an inquiry to try and find out who that was. Uh, and it was the ambulance driver who took her to hospital, as it turned out, because she wanted to describe somebody because she thought it was important. Uh, so anything she, she said, she took me the pinch of salt, so as a, as a sensible SIO, if you haven't got enough evidence from proper sources, you don't want to be taking anything but more in mind, to say, you know, too seriously, otherwise you can divert officers and that will waste somebody's time. So that's what happened there. Um, so the whole team, for a little while, did swing in the direction of looking for somebody else, but it quickly established who it was. Uh, how do we know, we talk about MOs, there was an MO difference, slightly different MO here, yeah. and, and how do we know when something's in or out of the sequence of, of an MO? Because it, it's an, a, a pattern that isn't, it's nothing like what's happened before. I can understand if somebody uses a hammer to hit somebody over the head in a red light district, and it's uh, one o'clock in the morning and it's a prostitute. Uh, if next time that happens, he uses a, a rope or a screwdriver, it's, the MO is different, but a lot of the circumstances are the same. But in some cases, the MO is completely different. So you first of all have to rule everything out before you have to rule them in. Now every attack on a woman or every prostitute that was attacked, you have to rule it out. Because that, now you're in that game. But let's see if it isn't from the Ripley, because he's getting a worse name than he perhaps deserves. And we're chasing shadows. So... Two months later, so he's, he's really pro pro prolific, this guy, isn't he? Gene Jordan. And this is where problems really started to develop, because Gene Jordan was murdered in Manchester. First time outside the force area, in the hospital grounds at Manchester. Um, the tug of war started now, that's the best way to describe it, between Manchester and West Yorkshire. Because Manchester had a murder, and they appointed an SIO. West Yorkshire had a handful of murders and they had an SIO. And the SIO from West Yorkshire told the SIO from Manchester, who was in the same rank, I'll be taking charge because this is linked with the Ripper and I'm investigating the Ripper. The guy from Manchester said, whoa, 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 this is Manchester, I take charge. And furthermore, you have made a complete knack of it anyway, so I think I can do better and I'm starting. I know nothing to do with that helping you. We'll have somebody in each camp so we can pass information, but when, uh, I am investigating my, my crime. Okay? Is that right or isn't it right? I don't know that. These are up there. Two assistant chief constables bottling it out. Um, so, that was never resolved and it did continue to cause problems because they didn't pass information from one to the other uh, about who, you know what the latest developments were in each one's case. They did have a liaison officer, but he was only able to keep up. Um, but almost immediately, the Manchester one drew up a problem to demonstrate how bad this SIO link there was. Because Jane Jordan had a secret compartment in the handbag and there's a five pound note in it. And the five pound note was issued four days earlier, brand new, was issued four days earlier at Bradford. And the Manchester SIO said, find who, wish, who gave her that five pound note, you found the murderer. Does that sound reasonable? Anybody think it doesn't sound reasonable? I'll give you the West Yorkshire SIO's version. He said, that's a five pound a trick girl. It's about two, hours to, uh, two, or, two or three hours to get from Bradford to Manchester, and it was paid in. That five pound note could have been passed to her by any number of people and furthermore she could have, it could have been changed for a tenner all sorts of things like that. You know, I'm not wasting any officers on chasing up five pound notes, even though you think it's a good lead. You do what you like, but we're not. But what the Manchester one did, he got the Bank of England to run the full £25,000 payload and they printed £25,000, brought it up to the bank in uh, Bradford where they were issued and they, on a Sunday they ran the entire thing. And they narrowed it down to six firms that could have got this five pound note. One of which was the one that Peter Sutcliffe worked at. But Manchester didn't tell West Yorkshire that because, well, sorry, you know, they're not telling us, we'll not tell them. So they were doing their own inquiries. So, yeah, this is, this is a clash of the eagles, isn't it? 
Um, anyway, so, it, but I'm not so sure how they would have managed to trace it. However, later on it was established that the Ripper had been back to Gene Dalton after he'd murdered her because he realised about this five pound mill, but he couldn't find it because he didn't have much time and he didn't find the secret compartment. So that was a big clue. And if they'd have followed that up, the might, might have got somewhere. A mistake. Um, 73 days later, Marilyn, Marilyn Moore. Uh, she survived and she gave. Uh, that's the first photo of it she gave, and that's a, that, that's a picture of Peter Sutcliffe, a photograph of Peter Sutcliffe. Well, it's pretty, light, pretty good like this, isn't it? You know, you're, you're really narrowing it down now. Uh, and so then uh, she gave another one. That one, she revised it a little bit. Uh, so that's what she said the person who attacked her looked like. And um, we found the tyre tracks again. So this enquiry is now really important. So if in the first place you decided the tyre tracks wasn't very good, as an SIO you've now been reduced to inspect. Uh, because I think the Chief Constable wouldn't be very happy that you just missed the best clue you've had so far, really. Um, that inquiry kept going on and on and on and on and that never got resolved because cars changed hands, as I said before, tyres had been uh, changed and that's, that's just it, it didn't happen. We got a good description of the car as well, you know, we got we're back to uh, a red car. You soon saw a red car, can you? Never found, might still be going on for all I know. Um, however, Marilyn Moore made one bit of an error. She said that the person with the, who assaulted her had a Liverpool accent. So, do you send the team off now to Liverpool to see if they can find anybody? They're not interested so far, I don't know. Who would send somebody off to Liverpool? Now, none of you are doing anything that you should be doing, are you? You should be sending somebody to Liverpool. Because they might say, we've been, hey, yes, we've just, funny enough, we've just had this. But you're not going to send anybody, okay? May or may not turn out to be a mistake for you, that might be. You're already inspector, you're in for sergeant now. Um, she also, also reported three sightings of the guy that had assaulted her. Now I'll bet you in Leeds, at any time, I could have found three people that looked like that. You know, because everybody looked like that. Because everybody wanted to look like Jason King, so finding somebody who looked like Jason King would have been a double. So she, she and those three were traced from her, couldn't catch the guy who did it, but we caught the three who didn't do it. Uh, usually because it had just passed them that she'd go screaming or something and somebody would go and grab that before. Have a break. Um, and we're back again, another 73 days later, Yvonne Pearson was murdered. She was a prostitute. We're back to Bradford again now, we're moving around an awful lot. I mean, you're chasing this, you're, not, you're never catching up, are you? You're just always going to the next scene. But it takes so long to deal with the scene, he's moved on. And, anyway, so Yvonne Pearson was next, murdered in Bradford. Back on my beat. And I knew her. Unreliable, difficult to deal with, and never ever speak to Yvonne Pearson on your own. Because she'll make allegations of every sort. Um, but she also had a little bit of a problem, did he, Um She was always owing fines. Now, if you're a prostitute and you're on your uppers and you've got five or six kids or whatever, you've got a family, uh, you cannot afford to be arrested and put before the magistrates because you owe, the, you owe a fine and sent to prison for a week. The kids are already with the neighbour while you're out prostituting. Whatever happens, you must not be arrested for non payment of the fine because you've got no money, so you can't pay it, so they disappear. And they go prostituting in Leeds, Huddersfield, or anywhere, and you don't know where they've gone. And they're not reported missing by anybody. The, the woman next door is used to this, so she keeps the kids till she turns up. And you don't you actually know she's missing. You might, after a few days, think, well, where's he one? You'll ask them. You'll get nothing from them. No, we haven't seen her. So you go around to the house, and you, you know, the woman next door, oh, she, I think she's just gone off to the shops. You, you know, this is a world of lies that you're living in. So nobody reported her missing. But eventually, somebody did report her missing, and we started looking for her. But her body wasn't discovered for two months uh, because it was hidden. That's a new one. It's usually just dumped over the wall. This one was hidden. So either something went, it changed on that particular night. But a month after she died, somebody went back and dragged the body out a little bit and put it underneath the oh, There was an overturned city. 
every red light area always has an overturn set in. <laughs> every one of them. Driving in any city, there's an overturn set, set in. That, that, that prostitute somewhere around here. Uh, and they put her underneath <coughs> this set in, where she might more likely be found, because the council soon later come and shift it. But what also they did, they put a newspaper under her arm, dated two weeks previous to the time when they moved her under the set in. Why would anybody do that? And the only person you'd think would be likely to do it would be the Ripper. He's the only person who, who knew she was there. But somebody found her, and somebody moved her, and somebody played a trick on the police and put the newspaper under. So you thought she'd been killed not when she had. But it was only the forensic examinations that found it was earlier. The Ripper's always denied it. And he's, to be fair to him, he's usually said what he's done. He's quite proud of what he did. So he ain't going to deny, unless that one's give him a bad name, I mean, you know, bad name, yeah. I've heard of her, but no, no, I've never moved her. Poof, no, I don't want that stigma. So, that was never at all. Anyway, so she was the next one. Um, and I'm just going to make sure I've covered everything. Right, uh, ten days later, we get to here, Helen Ripken. Now then, this is, this is Huddersfield. She's murdered in Huddersfield, first time in Huddersfield. Uh, so the police all of a sudden got another problem, got another murder incident room to open up in a completely new place. They only had a very small red light area in Huddersfield. Um, but the story about Helen Ripka's murder is a little bit different to the others. Because we talked to the prostitutes in Bradford and Leeds and suggested to them that they might operate a security system. And we proposed to them that they write down the count, you work in twos, and you write down the car number of, of your mate if, if she's picked up. And if they're not back in 30 minutes, you tell the police. You got, you know, I mean, that's the best you could, you could come up with. And I, they agreed to that. And they were doing that. And if you came back in 30 minutes, you had to tore it up or you give them a piece of paper. And the, the punters were having to go along with that because pressure was heavy. You know, they were being prevented from, from getting the kicks by going down to the red light area. So that, that was working. There'd been nothing in Huddersfield, but Huddersfield decided to do a security system of their own. It was inferior, as it, as it clearly shows. Um, they worked in twos, and they waited till they, to get two clients, and they each had 30 minutes, and they came back to the same spot. Now, I don't know how many hundreds were queuing up at Huddersfield and doing two at a time, for God's sake, but that's what they were doing. And in the case of Helen Ritka, she was with a twin, um, and they got a client each and went, and after 20 minutes, Helen came back, I was going to wait, but another put the cable on, so she broke her rules, and it was just a very bad choice of client, because that was the ripper. So, um, that's, how, that's how it was. But then something strange started to happen, something you'll all remember up here. Because at that point, a letter was sent to George Oldfield, and the letter sort of said, um, you know, threats to, uh, uh, you know, I'm the killer, I'm carry on killing prostitutes. I apologise for Jane MacDonald, that, that was a mistake. Uh, you mentioned the Preston killing, there was no Preston killing, but they think they got it in location wrong somewhere. Uh, and uh, an explanation why the letter was posted in Sunderland, because he was uh, in his truck and that was on his rounds and he saw a box and he, he wanted to post it away from the city so that it distracted things. Uh, so, I also sent one to the editor of the Daily Mirror in Manchester, similar threats and an apology, and praising George Oldfield, saying, you know, if anybody's going to get me, it's George Oldfield, you know, I'm a bit worried about him, he's very good, blah, blah, blah. But then another year passed, and the most infamous um, I would say see you again, probably won't. tip ever, yeah, ever sent to the police anywhere, you. Or from anywhere in the world. you remember it, first few lines, you remember it. I'm Jack. I see you observe no one catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George. Good Lord. You are not even catching me now. And four years ago when I started. I reckon young boys are letting you down, George. They can't be much good, can they? I'm fucking the The only time they came there touching me was a few months back in Chapel Down. When I was disturbed, even then it was a uniform colour, not a decapit. I warned you in March that I'd spread it. 
trying to get somebody to do with you. What we should have said is, be with somebody. You know. Uh, but people, women didn't want to be pushed around like that. They wanted to push them around and try to protect them. And also, it saved the number of assaults on women by the vigilantes that were out looking for women on the road at night. So, you, know, you see how complex this all got, and it all uh, slowed things down. But this is all the world, this is the world where the Ripper and his ilk <coughs> operated. You know, this was not, this is commonplace to them. So they were at war in their environment, and everybody else wasn't. There's was only a few people, like, you know, the, the beat bobby for the red light area, poor old me, I, I don't know where I drove through that shop shop, but, you know, who felt the, the, a little bit more comfortable, because it was a, not a nice place to be. Um, I, I feel certain that I would never, never have been harmed in a red light area who would have come to my assistance because I was somebody they knew. Uh, and frequently they did. The pimps as well. Because you had to get on with these people. Okay, I'll have to look about, look about what I was doing. Um, okay, well that's the last presentation with Helen Ripker. That might be the first one on here actually, was it? Yes, uh, well, that's where we left it. Huddersfield, she'd been picked up by the Ripper and uh, he killed her. And then a twin got back, she wasn't there. And that's, well, that's sort of where we were. Um, okay, 104 days. And, 104 days is a long time, isn't it, what he's been doing? He must have gone on holiday or something. And I'll tell you another thing they did. They thought, well, if there's a long gap, he's been in prison. So every prisoner gets interviewed. Can you imagine how many that is? You know, see how complicated this is all get. Anyway, so now we've got... Um, uh, bum, 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 lost the run here. Vera Millwall. Back in Manchester. So here we are. All things swings back to Manchester now. What do we find at the scene there? Tire tracks. Exactly the same tire tracks. This guy's still got the car. You know. So if you decided not to chase up that car ages ago, you're in a bit of bother now because you wish you had. Because you're halfway through the 100,000 cars in West Yorkshire, aren't you? But now you've got another 250,000 cars in Greater Manchester added to your list. So I am still so keen to keep following this up. You've got officers doing this day in, day out, never stopping and getting nowhere near. But you've now got another 250,000. But he has still got the car. So, you know, it, this, this is getting to be a bigger clue than you, uh, than you thought before. Um, also, virtually everybody's in Sunderland, aren't they chasing with your side, Jack? So you've got not next to nobody not new to you, and you've got more victims. Um, and also Manchester now has a problem, don't they? Because they've got a serial killer. The same serial killer as where Yorkshire's got. So it's about time they sort of started talking to each other now because things are going a little bit wrong. And also now, unbeknown to everybody, he's decided he's not killing prostitutes anymore. Uh, he's going to kill anyone. And the reason he did that, why do you think it is? Pressure from the police. The prostitutes are now too worried because we always thought that uh, it was after. Because he apologised, because Jack apologised for the, the non prostitute one. Uh, we assumed that he'd made a mistake in the union of prostitutes. So they're well guarded. But now we've left everybody else vulnerable. Okay, you know, I apologise. But what can I do? I don't know he's going to do that. He's the only one who knows what he's going to do next. That's part of the problem. You cannot, uh, you can't pin it down. Um, there's a bit of a gap then, ten months before he does. And this is the longest gap there's been. So ten months, and he's. Um, he, he can't, uh, uh, ignore that one for a moment. He attacks a girl called Anne Rooney. There's no slide of her because she was a college student and she was attacked in college grounds. Uh, so he's really taking risks now. You know, he's driven off the streets and he's prowling around colleges on an evening. Um, she told the police that the attacker was driving a black sunbeam rapier. This had been mentioned before, but he had long curly hair and a drooping moustache, but there's no photo of it that I managed to trace of that. Does that remind you of anyone? Mm. Yeah, of course it does, doesn't it? Right from the word go, it's reminded of it all the time. Uh, but now the police had a problem with photo fits because the helpful public who really want to be helpful and now know what the Ripper looks like. So everybody who's attacked by anybody says it was the Ripper that did it. 
because you'll get two things out of that. You'll get publicity and you'll get the police interested. So they'll investigate it. But if you went into a police station otherwise and said, oh, I've just been attacked by a man in the street, I don't know what I, can I, uh, I, can't, I couldn't give you the description. It's not going to be investigated. You know, so the photo fits are now becoming their own worst enemy because you're now telling everybody what the Ripper looks like and therefore everybody thinks they're attacked by the Ripper and they've seen him in the street. And that became another big problem because they were coming into the police station and I've just seen the Ripper. You say, look, he's just walking down there. Well, everybody looked like the Ripper. That's, that was the trend of the time. So you were arresting all, or chasing up and arresting all sorts of people who had nothing to do with it. And then you're having to sort of, oh, sorry, oh, dust in there. Here, here, go, go, go get yourself a look, go get a little bit here and book it off. Um, so, you know, you couldn't, so no more photo fits out to the public. They're stopping. Um, there's rules now about identification that could never happen now. Because now, if, if I was to say that my friend Dennis over here was the one who attacked me, right? They'd go and arrest Dennis, but then they'd have an ID parade to make sure that I knew what Dennis looked like. So they'd line Dennis up with, with another six Dennises, and I'd have to pick the right, the right one. In fact, if I said, if my wife said, my husband's attacked me, I'd have to stand in an ID parade for her to identify me, in case she didn't actually know who I was. <laughs> But it stops all this about, you know, where you say, yes, I know, it was, it was man who lives three doors a lot. And you go and arrest the man who lives three doors a lot, and it wasn't him because your identification was flawed because, you know, you didn't quite see him. So, so that's, um, that's what's happening there. Okay, the Sunbeam Rapier Clue was a good lead. And this is another SIO one that you've got to, um, you've, you've got to think about. Remember when we were doing the uh, checks on the, on the cassettes, we were reading out the car numbers, but they were all being locked. And uh, what they were looking for was a car used more than once, uh, because you couldn't get around the mall. But if there's a car, to go red light areas, a prowlers areas, you're there all the time. So you know, if, if some, a car's seen as a one-off, not a problem. If it's seen more than once, a bit of a problem. Uh, but after that, you're, you're interested. So, 850 um, cars, uh, some being rapier cars of this particular type, were seen whilst those checks were going on. Um, 21 of them were seen twice. Only three of them were seen three times. It's got to be a good clue, hasn't it? It's got to be. If she's right, and it was a sunbeam rapier, and you've got a sunbeam rapier, three sunbeam rapiers, in an area you were looking to expect to find something, you, you're, you're, you're homing in. Who do you suppose one of these was? Yeah. It was Sutcliffe. Okay, so you've only got three to interview, one of them Sutcliffe. Uh, and that meant the home visit. A bit of a problem with the home visits, isn't there? Because he's on the not to be checklist. Uh, and you incur, you go and visit one of these people. I mean, if you've interviewed him as many times as you have, and you still haven't found the reason to go. Another visit is going to get up in arms. They're going to be up in arms. You know, we're harassing them now. You know, why do you keep going to leave? So it wasn't, it wasn't even done. It wasn't even uh, done. It just, don't do it. Too much, there's too, we get too much political trouble out of this because he's got big backers. His boss. And his boss is rude. Uh, anyway, the MO was different. It was in college grounds. She wasn't a prostitute. It probably wasn't the Ripper anyway. She had still up a hornet's nest for no apparent purpose. Uh, the main focus was still where? Sunderland. So why are we bothering with all of this? Let's just keep it wait, keep it later. We might come back to it. If we aside Jack's our target. See how much damage that did. Uh, we didn't tell Manchester anything about this. Because it had clouded their investigation. They were happy to go it alone. They might turn something up by not being encumbered by all our problems. So we didn't tell them. I'm taking the blame here, you understand that? Don't you? I, was a, I was a PC. Okay, where am I in this? I'm plot. I'm walking around the red light there and you'd expect to be attacked by somebody who's got five heads, you know, and he's 18 feet tall. So, so anyway, we're not going to waste any resources on a false lead. One month later, Josephine Whittaker. 
she's murdered. She was a building society clerk and she was murdered in Halifax, wasn't she? Yeah, she was. She was found on the green in public view. They murdered her right in front of people on the grass on the other side of the road from pubs and that. They left her there all night, nobody spotted her. Uh, new murder squad, new town, new murder squad. Um, so they've all got to be briefed and told what's going on, as if they didn't know, but you know, Halifax, uh, you know, they don't know a lot, do they? <laughs> It wasn't the laughing stock of the false keys anymore, don't worry. Um, but there was a lot of clues at uh, this particular one. The wallet and boot print appears again. For God's sake, he's trying to get rid of these wallet and boots, you know. The moment, I'd have got rid of them. I'd have got shot of everything I was wearing, wouldn't you? But he's so confident God's protecting him. He's still got the bloody wallet and boots on. <laughs> he's wearing them. Um, a witness saw two people, which he describes as the... What, what, reasonably could be assumed was those two, her and, and, and the Ripper. And there was an argument going on according to this witness. A bit of an argument, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Another result. Um, and um, <coughs> guess what? That's, that's the description that the witness gave. Here we go again. But you see, we're ignoring photo fits now, aren't we? Because he might have been completely making it up. If the police are coming and saying, did you get a look at this guy? And you say yes. And you know who they're looking for. You're inclined, and you're not, to give a description to match the person you thought it ought to be. So you've got to be wary about that. Um, so, I was it genuine then, or was it a likeness of the publicity? Other evidence at the scene gave a distinct impression that the guy was a lorry driver, with a, a, an engineering background. Do we know anybody like that? <laughs> huh? Yeah, we won't go near him, he's the right hot potato, isn't he? You wouldn't dare touch him. So some re-interviewing needs doing now. There's going to have to be interviewed. Sod the press and the problems that they're going to be caused. He's got to be interviewed. Uh, at his home. That's where we're going to go. No, no, it's going to work. We're going to sort it out when it's home. Now, the, the next bit is a little bit, a little bit made up. Um, the officers that went had photos of the sole of the boots. Because we're linking the white right boots. They're all busy. They had fo photos of the sole of the boots. And he was wearing them during the interview when they checked him. Oh. Hang on, hang on. There's, a, there's a twist to this. There was a sunbeam rapier on the drive, and they had the photo fits. Uh, but they, they didn't do anything about it. The interviewer didn't ask him about what they were there to ask him about, and went. But this information comes from Sutcliffe when he was finally arrested. And I'll read what he put in his statement when they were interviewing him on this occasion. He said, I stayed dead calm and as I got into the wagon I realised I was standing on the steps, which were mesh, and they could look up and see for themselves that I was wearing those boots, but they didn't. They couldn't see what were in front of their eyes. Now, is it true or was it made up? Are they so incompetent that they couldn't spot anything here? These are six detectives. Or are they just so fed up with it all, you know, they were no longer looking because everything, and they made a newish reputation and they paid it lip service. Um, some reasons why they might have, this all might have happened. First of all, frequent interviews create frequent complaints. And I, I know myself, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you speak to somebody, the more you speak to them, the more they'll complain, and the more people will side with them when they didn't side with you in the first place. One minute you want to do something about him. After you've done something about him, you're a little bit over heavy there, you know. I think I think I should be you, we should complain about him, yeah. So the more you interview people, the more people complain. Um, and uh, he'd already been interviewed so many times, surely you can trust your colleagues who have got this right. You know, why am I doing this? Maybe the officers didn't have the info in the first place, that we were going for a specific purpose, maybe you know, something unrelinked un this. Too many inquiries per officer by now. You might have 20 people to see in a day. How are you going to do that? You've got to cut some corners, and this is one way you can cut a corner, isn't it? You know, this guy's on the radar. He's been seen. Let's, we'll just go knock on the doors out and then go up, because we've got other more important things. Uh, or, of course, it could all have been made up by something. I have no proof one way or the other. All the paperwork went to one location in Leeds. The floor was so heavy now that it had to be reinforced to stop it collapsing. And I, I, I went into the, in the room, it was full of card indexes. Every room, everywhere, floor to ceiling. 
How anybody knew where anything was, I have absolutely no idea. Uh, so reports could wait days or weeks or even months before they were looked at. So somebody said, said put something in and said, this is the ripper. Might be three months before anybody looked at this, by which time, you know, we either caught him or, or it'd been discounted. So it was just unbelievable. Anyway, 150 days later, whilst the police have about had it by now, our friend isn't, because now he killed Barbara Leach. Um, in Bradford again. So we're all back to Bradford. The whole machinery goes back there. She wasn't a prostitute. She wasn't in the red light area. She was a college student, 20 years old. So the murder squad gets enlarged yet again. I don't know where they're getting these boxes of bobbies from. I have absolutely no idea. But there was a huge public reaction to this. Gangs of women were now not... They were hunting them and cornering them and stoning them and attacking them and putting them in hospital. You know, and they were organising themselves into great big protests and they were marching down the street with banners, you know. Oh, because the police made a bit, well, it didn't seem like a mistake at the time, but it was, because they advised women not to go out. When the women said, hang on, we're not killing anybody, why don't you advise men not to go out? Well, okay then, you know, so, uh, that's how it was. And that's what we did, and that's what the reaction was. We're going to go out, we're going to go out in huge numbers and protest, and we're going to watch, march through all these areas we can't go, and we're going to cause trouble. You know, because it's about time they got some trouble. Who they is, I'm not sure. So that's what happened. And that needed all policing because there was fights breaking out. Uh, because the, the, actually the, um, the pimps started to find out that there was a force out there that they couldn't control. Normally a couple of pimps would go and give somebody a good hiding. You know, a group of pimps would go and beat up a group of people. But all of a sudden now the streets full of women with placards, you know, I think I'll just go for a pint. <coughs> uh, so, um, and then, and then the rumour spread that the Ripper has got to be a police officer. Because they're not catching him. So, actually you're not safe. You know, nobody's safe now. No man's safe, and apparently no women's safe, because the Ripper's out there doing for the women, and the women are out there doing for the men. You know, and somewhere in between this, you've got to, you've got to try and catch it. See how hard it's getting, it just, it just grew and grew and grew. Um, anyway, a bit of a gap then, a year. And that year is important, because um, Margarita Walls um, was murdered. She was a prostitute. Again, we're back to Leeds. Um, but there was a bit of a problem here because the MO was changed because he strangled her with a rope. That's the first time he'd done that. And dragged her along behind him, God knows how far, and, and threw her over the wall. Uh, now the police thought this was a copycat because they weren't sure that all the details had ever leaked out because they wouldn't want it to. First of all, it's gruesome, it upsets people, but they want the murderer to be able to tell them what nobody knows. So they didn't think that anybody knew how the murders were being committed. They thought it was a copycat. And there had also been a long gap, so they thought he'd gone dormant. And they were sort of breathing a sigh of relief. So, right, we can get on with the inquiries now, because we're not fire brigade policing now, we can get on and deal with it. Um, so, uh, that had to be later changed, because a lot of the MO was the same. Once, it, once the forensic tests had been done and the post-mortem, they had to change it. Anyway, no worries, 35, just a reminder, 35 days later, he's still not finished. He attacks this um, uh, uh, Upadira Bandari. Um, she survived the attack and she was in Leeds. She, she was making such a noise that a nearby resident phoned the police and the ripper ran. But a good description um, was obtained. It's the usual one. You don't need to see him anymore. It's exactly the same. Uh, but no photo of it was taken, but she did do one of these sketch things that they do. It wasn't linked because the MO uh, of Margaret Walls was already discounted because it was the same thing. You like the rope now. You see, that seemed to be very good. It was, uh, probably not as messy as the hammer. It was easy. Just round the neck and then walk off dragging them behind you. I don't know. But it was now rope he was using. So they thought, well, it's a copycat serial killer. He's killed the second one. So we've now got two serial killers. One is trying to be the other. Uh, so you've got, now got to form a separate murder squad to investigate Ripper 2 as opposed to Ripper 1 and not get confused. It's getting harder. Can you keep up with this? I, I'm struggling myself. I was there. Um, anyway, on Bonfire Night 1980, Teresa Sykes um, was, was attacked. She survived, but she was 16 years old and we're back in Huddersfield again. Now, 
what happened here was that she screamed. She was right outside her own house, and she screamed, and her boyfriend came out, and the ripper ran, and the boyfriend chased him, but the ripper got away, hid in some bushes, and the, and the ripper, boyfriend lost sight and went back to see her because she'd been attacked. You know, he, he's got a choice, hasn't he? You might as well you better go back and help her. But he can give a good description. So I think he saved her from being, uh, from being killed. And it was only 8 o'clock at night, and that was the earliest he ever struck. 8 o'clock at night. Uh, on bonfire night. You know, I mean, that's significant, that's a close. Um, they were reluctant to link that with the Ripper, but eventually they had to because the similarities of the arrow were the same. Now we're trying to... Have we got copycats out there? It's how it complicated, it's getting even more complicated. Some of these have been done by other people, just because they're out there, aren't they? Anybody, give them the opportunity, somebody will find a way. Um, so... This one was significant because it was the first time the alibi between Sutcliffe and his wife varied. Because when she was later interviewed, she said he was in all night. And he said he was do out doing a favour for a friend. And, and they, they, they differed. He never differed before. Um, but this one they did. Uh, Twelve days later, Jacqueline Hill. Twelve days? I, I mean, it's just bonkers, isn't it? Uh, anyway, 12 days later, he murdered Jacqueline Hill. In Leeds, she wasn't a prostitute, she was just a student. Uh, it was in exactly the same place as uh, um, Dr. Bandari, two attacks ago, and 100 yards from her home at 9.30 at night. Uh, he murdered her and dumped her body nearby over a wall. That's the, that was the back to the normal MO. Uh, hit with a hammer, over the wall, do what you want to do, leave the body there and go home. Uh, job well done. But uh, next, what happened next was shameful. Uh, and the two officers should hang their heads in shame forever. Because 30 minutes after the attack, some students were passing and they found a handbag on the pavement with some little blood spots around it. And they reported it to the police and the coppers came and they found the handbag and they gave a cursory glance around and then logged it in his farm pocket. Uh, and if they'd have moved 20 yards away over the wall, they'd have found it. They'd have found it. But they didn't. Now, what they said was, you know, this was found property. You know, it was a woman's handbag that was found. What about the spots of blood? Didn't see them, but they were there. So that was shameful. Somebody there, an eye off the ball. Surely, for God, every, everybody knew, must have known, that they were looking for a killer. And a woman's handbag was going around it. Surely must have given some blood. It didn't. So somebody's really cocked up there, and that's very, very bad. Um, it's going to be put right short of it. So was evidence lost? It certainly was. Uh, was the Ripper still around? It might have been. We don't know. <coughs> By the time they trailed back to the police station, handed this damn thing in and logged it in, and somebody had, uh, had picked it up, it was too late. She was found the next morning and dumped over the wall. Uh, but things are about to change dramatically now because we now get to the point where the arrest is about to be made. And it's a very interesting how it happened. Uh, 46 days later, he was arrested. Not by detectives. None of all these inquiries produced anything. But Bobby's doing what Bobby's do. Being nosy. The, the copper's nose, is a, a, it, it, it works. Because you get a feeling that something's not right. When you're looking at something, it didn't, it didn't look right. Um, I'll give you an example of how that works. We get a pocketbook, and you're obliged to put in your pocketbook certain things, like a, a reply somebody makes, or uh, whatever you, you, you're told to put in dur during the course of your shift, you know, when you were at certain points, or, or anybody you saw, who you spoke to, blah. but you could also put in anything you wanted. Anything that you fancied writing down, you could write down. But I probably got through a pocketbook every month. But there was a guy on our shift, he got through a pocketbook a day. He wrote copiously, never stopped writing, pocketbook after pocketbook. And one day there was a case that was a murder trial, and it depended on whether or not two people knew each other. And they couldn't prove that they did. And he thought, I'm sure they do. I'll go through my pocketbook. So he looked at he opened his pocketbook, and the pocketbook showed that the car registered to one of them was parked outside the other one's house a certain period of time on a, on a certain date. And that was the link that they were looking for. Just because he was so nosy, he was writing it down. 
And you yeah, have a tendency to poke your nose into other people's business just because you want to, because you think something's not quite right. So that's so Bobby and diligently you should be poking your nose into what people are doing. And that's what happened. And, um, if it don't smell right, it isn't right, that's the sort of thing we used to say. So Sutcliffe now was changing his tactics. He was about to go on a new spree in the he was targeting South Yorkshire now, Sheffield principally. But he knew now that number plates were becoming important, that the police were ever getting closer. And uh, so what he decided to do, he said he'd, he decided he'd, go with, he'd go with his car, which was a Rover by now. He took his Rover to a scrapyard in Murphy, which is a Jewsbury in West Yorkshire, where he stole the number plates off a Skoda and put them on his Rover. Now bear in mind, if you drove past in a Rover, in, in a car, he wrote the registration number down, but when he checked it out, It'd be ages afterwards it would come back as a rover, but you wouldn't know what the number of the rover was, so you couldn't have been caught. That, you know, nowadays it, it, that would all flag up straight away, that's on the wrong car. But then it didn't. Somebody had to spot it and note it. So then it often goes to Sheffield, now knowing he's safe from any of these checks, because they'll just take the wrong number down by trying to get the police station to find out it's all wrong. He'll be long gone. Anyway, so he um, he sees he sees these two. Olivia Reavers and Denise Hall, uh, and they're um, operating the uh, South Yorkshire system of self-protection, working in twos. Good idea. Keeps you secure. Maybe. Anyway, um, one of them gets in the car, Olivia Reavers, and Tuckley drives off with her in the car, and uh, but then along come these two. But we're out on patrol in their, in their car and they're nosy. They know what's going on, they've had nothing in South Yorkshire, but that doesn't stop them. They're thinking all the time, you know, what's going to happen, what can we do next, what, is there something going on around here, I'm, I'm nosy, I want to know. So, they see a car up a back alley and they see the usual movement inside the car. But, uh, so they go along and they chat to the two people in it, and one of which is there is Peter Sutcliffe for one of them is Olivia Reavers. Um, checked out the vehicle number and the vehicle number comes back as a Skoda. So we've got something not quite right. So they decide they're going to talk to these two and they'll take them out of the car and they take the ignition keys off them, switch the engine off, you keep the keys. The best they can do is run away. Um, you can't drive away. So they go back to the car with her, the two officers, and leave him in the car. That might seem strange to you, but by then the police had a rule that no solitary male officer will arrest a female and be alone with her at all. Must be two, because allegations were rife. So, you know, they marked and said to him, stay where you are. If you want to run away, run, I'm faster than you. We go take the police car behind. He said, well, can I have a wee? I'm pushed him. So they say, well, just go and have a wee over there. Keep an eye on you. Uh, so we go and put her in the car. He goes and has a wee and comes back and gets in the car. They arrest him for theft and they arrest her for prostitution. Take him to the police station, they're logged in, and um, they check out the vehicle number again, they find out yeah, it's definitely a scoder, the definitely the police are definitely stolen, blah blah blah. And uh, what they do then is they ring West Yorkshire because where the crime's committed is where the offence has to be dealt with. So West Yorkshire said, Well come and pick him up in the morning, come and pick him up in the morning, and they just bailed her and charged him bailed her for prostitution. And uh, the Ripper stayed in custody until West Yorkshire came the next morning, took him down to Jewsbury, and uh, when, he got, when they got to Jewsbury, one of the best policies that George Oldfield did came into being then, because he said, everybody, everybody who's arrested with a prostitute will not be released from custody until the Ripper squad have interviewed him, because that might be the way to catch him. Uh, so, normally for theft of number plates, you'd get to Jewsbury, you'd be interviewed, you'd admit it, you'd be bailed to court. You know, they're just going to keep you in custody for stealing number plates. But no, they have to keep them until the Ripper Squad went. And when the first two Ripper officers went, they, the coppers and those again, they were suspicious. Circum all the circumstances didn't seem right. What did they find then? Let's have a look. He had a five pound note hidden in his coat. He had a secret pocket. Why? Why would he want to do that? He looked like the photo of it. Yeah, yeah, so did everybody. Came from Bradford. Yeah. Was a lorry driver, yeah, been interviewed numerous times, foot size matched the wallet and boots, but he wasn't wearing them. They were thorough. 
It started taking everything apart and looking very, very closely at this guy. There was something not right here, it's not right. He was expecting to get bailed, uh, charged and bailed. Um, they did an initial interview, took a blood sample from him. Uh, that came back as the same group as some of the other um, murders, but there hadn't been many times when he'd been injured. So, but it was a common group. Millions and millions of people had it. So, but it was a clue. It was moving in a little bit closer. Um, there wasn't a system of matching exactly. So questioning him began. Uh, his background, reason for his arrest, all that. He's linked with prostitution. You know, had he done it before? The sort of thing you want to ask. But he was very pleasant. He was willing to speak. And he was very accommodating. Nice fellow. You know, he came across as a nice guy. He was questioned all day. Put back into the cell overnight for, for, for any queries to be checked out on the things that he'd said. Sergeant Ring came on the next night, really surprised to find that somebody who'd been arrested for stolen number plates and had gone to Jewsbury was still in custody, not only still in custody, but being talked to by the Ripper Squad. So he, I, I'm, he said, I'm going to go back to the scene because when he went for a wee, something's happened. So he goes back to the scene and in the bushes he finds a hammer and a knife. So he takes them into his possession, calls out the, the squads to preserve the scene, and we start the investigation into the bring it to court of the Ripper. Um, a twitching nose again, isn't it, by the copper? Oldfield was delighted at this. Jumped the gun as he did, you know, telling the press, we've got him. Remember it, we've got him. Oh, well, we've got the Ripper, he's in custody. Well, well, yet. He hasn't, he hasn't admitted anything yet. Um, Sonia was arrested. She was extensively questioned. She identified the knife as one that she thought she'd lost ages ago. But she was never charged with anything. And I might have to cover a little bit of that at the end. Sutcliffe was interviewed again and pretty quickly he said, it's me. I'm the Ripper. And can you imagine? You go, you're, you're interviewing me. You go into the cell and they, they said, right, now then. And it's, it's me. I'm the Ripper. Your heart must be. You know, must be going. Bum, 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 bum. You know, all this. This is the guy I'm standing in front of him now. You know, I don't know how they felt, but they must have been absolutely delighted. And then his admission went on for 16 hours. You know, while he was being interviewed, I identified everything he'd done because you had to prove he did it. He could be this. He could be the copycat or something. <coughs> it all up once the publicity. Something he was a bit balmy. So 16 hours he was spoken to. He had to describe the attacks with sufficient knowledge to prove. That, you know, it must be him. Um, he said where the weapons were. That's what was recovered. Some of the weapons that he'd used. Uh, I'll, I'll let you your own imagination imagine what he did with all these weapons. But these are, some of, these are the weapons that they recovered. All of which were linked to murders. Because they all had uh, blood on them. Of some form or other. Uh, they were mostly recovered from his garage. Where Sonia never went, by the way. In her life she never ever went to the garage. Um, same hour, I suppose we're never going by garage, I'm sure. Um, the police had the map. They knew that now. But he asked one question. Can I tell Sonia? So they said yes. So they brought Sonia to him. She went into the cell. She said, what's all this about, Peter? He said, it's me, I'm the Ripper. She said, hey, Peter, what on earth did you do that for? <laughs> and walked out. <laughs> huh? Just like that, schizophrenic. <laughs> so that's, what, that's, that's how that all came, that came about. Anyway. Then I'll help her up loose. I'm, I'm sure those of you around at the time will remember what happened there. There was a press conference. It was chaos. Absolute chaos. They couldn't get, there was press from all over the world. They couldn't get in the room. They had to put loudspeakers out into the street. Um, a media stampede. Anyone at all now who links to Sutcliffe was now a target for the press. The neighbours, uh, people from school, uh, his employees at work, his boss, everybody, the press were everywhere. And it gets it was such a scandal that, that, that there was an inquiry, I don't really remember the press inquiry about from the river. It changed the rules of press, how they can do things. They cannot do all this before a trial. They, you know, they've got statements from anybody, prostitutes who have been questioned in the street, you know, can you give us an interview, love? Would you just stop for a minute while well, you can give us an interview? Um, and, you know, Everybody saw so, there was so much trouble. Eventually, it had a, a, a national inquiry into press conduct, and, and as a result, the code of conduct came out, which they, they have to stick to now. There was loads of legal arguments about press freedom: what can they do, what can't they do, and it, it all delayed the trial. 
Anyway, the first court proceeding started only a few days later <coughs> when he, he was charged with theft of number plates and the murder of Jacqueline Hill. Now that might seem strange why we do that. Well, he's, he's arrested for a theft uh, and he has to be charged with that theft or he can't appear at court for another... You can't arrest somebody for theft and say, like, I'm not bothering with the theft, I'm going to charge him with murder. He's got to carry the first one to get him to the court and then at the court the charges are put to him. Um, so that's what happened there. The second court... Uh, sorry, the second court appearance, the stolen plates charge is dismissed and he's then charged with all 23 offences. And he's asked how he pleads and he pleads not guilty on the grounds of diminished responsibility. And now this is where you're going to play a big part because very shortly you're going to take your SIO hat off and put a different one on. The case was then transferred to the Old Bailey because he wouldn't get a fair trial in West Yorkshire. I think that's pretty obvious, isn't it really? But I'm not so sure he'd get a fair trial in the Old Bailey, but maybe fair. Let's put it that way. Um, he claimed at his defence that he was spoken by, to by God 17 years <coughs> earlier when he was doing a grave in Bingley. Remember the grave digger? And the, what, he, what he said was, um, I, I, I took a grave for a man who was going to be buried the next morning. Uh, and then he said, a day after that, I went to dig the next grave, and the other the guy had been put in his grave, and his headstone was there. And he said, I was digging this grave, and I heard a voice. And when I looked up, it was simply coming from this grave next to it. He said, and when I looked, he said, the word Jesus was written on the tombstone. He said, I know it's Jesus because it was in Polish, and my wife's family are Polish. Uh, and I know a little bit of Polish, and I know it said Jesus. Uh, he said, and, and the grave kept talking to me, saying, it was God saying, I can kill the Jews. And he said, God's been telling me to do this all along. I couldn't have stopped myself. You know, I'm not, I can't be held responsible. I admit I did it. I did the lot. And he didn't, he said he, which ones he didn't do, he said. So, <coughs> he's been honest. He said, I've done all this, I didn't do them. Somebody's copying me there. You can go and find him. But, but I was driven by God. And God caused me to do this. And this is how God caused me to do it. Uh, he said, and, I've, and, and of course, I've got evidence that God was on my side, because you've interviewed me so many times, you haven't spotted me yet. You know, he's protecting me. He, he brought the long way aside, Jack, and he did this and he did that. Um, and anyway, possible. Sorry. So that was his defence. Now then, what I want you to do, I want you to be the jury. Now, you knew all the facts, and the jury would know all the facts. I've not, not told you anything, it's not a fact here. He's going to go somewhere for the rest of his life because he's admitted doing this and he definitely did it. Therefore, if he's going to go away for the rest of his life, he's claiming that he was driven to this because of mental illness. And the law says that if you can't prove beyond all reasonable doubt, all reasonable doubt, you cannot be convicted. So if you've got any doubt whatsoever that what he's saying is the truth, you must acquit him of murder but then he'll be sentenced to life in a mental institution. Okay? So there's no possibility of him going out. He'll never go out. But where does he go? Is he right? Or isn't he? Because if he's right and he's mentally disturbed, you cannot send him to prison because you're, commit, you're subjecting a man to inhuman treatment when he couldn't help himself. But uh, you understand what I'm saying? So if you've got any doubt, you must acquit him. So what I'd like to do now, you're the jury, how many would acquit him? <laughs> so what do you think the jury found up there, down there? Ten to two, guilty of murder. Okay, so that, they agree with you. That he murdered these women. But I'll give you a piece of evidence that, that I should have given you that might change your mind. Look at that. What's it say at the bottom? Jago. Jesus. That's Jesus in Polish. Now, he says... That 17 years ago he saw that, and that grave spoke to him because it was Jesus, and God was speaking to him. Now, has he kept that for 17 years, so when he was caught he could say that, or is he genuinely? But there it is, it existed. They took the whole lot, the whole kit and kaboom in coaches all the way from the old Bailey to see that in Bingley. The jury as well. I mean, has that changed your mind a little bit? No. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you're, a you're, a, you're a cruel bunch. Anyway, so suffice to say that it was, it was 10 to 2, the, the verdict. Now, um, he was convicted of 23, um, um, 
life sentences, all to run concurrently, because it's a bit difficult to run a life sentence consecutively, isn't it? Even though the Americans think you can. Because in America, you could be go to jail for 300 years with a possibility of parole after that. Um, so that's what, he, that's what he got sentenced to. That was later changed to a full life term because the judge can only give a life sentence with a recommendation for how long to stay in prison. He cannot give a life sentence. But the Home Secretary could change it to a full term sentence, which is what he got, and he's been in prison ever since. However, it has had periods when he's left and gone to Rampton and then gone back and then to Broadmoor and gone back because he's wavering between one or the other. And I don't think the medical people think that he wasn't mental. I think they think he was. And they think that the jury was wrong. Uh, and they keep bringing him in and they keep having to send him back because the Home Secretary will say, oh, back, never mind taking him out of there. So I want to give you a few little um, bits and pieces of facts that you may or may not know. He was 35 years old when he was convicted of the 23 offences. He's now 70, uh, 74 year old and has therefore spent longer in jail than outside it. He has diabetes. No. Oh, oh come on, right response. Oh. There's more hours to come up and tell you. The biggest hour's been there. Um, he was blinded in his left eye in 1997 when another prisoner attacked him with a fork. Oh, that's the right, right response. You're getting the message now. That's the right response. Um, he's now completely blind, and you'll love this one, because he went for an operation on the NHS, and it went wrong. So he went blind in the other eye. Come on. Oh, why right, that? You're getting the idea now. Okay. Um, he's now in a wheelchair because of his diabetes, and he has a white stick. He's been attacked numerous times by other prisoners. Oh, that's good. Oh, yeah. uh, and he spent many, many occasions backwards and forwards to Broadmoor, where they're trying their best to make sure that he gets uh, um, kept there, but they really struggling to find him um, mental. The police have spoken to him about 17 other... That's the press, isn't that the press? The press, this is press. <laughs> the police have spoken to him seven, about 17 other attacks they believe he committed. He hasn't admitted any of them. There's no evidence that he has. Now, that's worrying.